So, hi. You're all very welcome to the first of our Collegium Talks this year. I'm Silva Normia, and I'll be chairing today's session. So I'm a core fellow at the Helsinki Collegium, and I'm a linguist working on historical linguistics and on typology. Our panel today consists of three excellent researchers, um, all from slightly different disciplines. So Anna Usachova, um, Andreas Bieler, and Jana Simola. Before they introduce themselves, I'll say just a couple of words about the Helsinki Collegium and Collegium Talks. So Collegium Talks is a series of public discussions organized by the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies and Think Corner. The Helsinki Collegium is an independent research institute within the University of Helsinki, located just up there on Fabian and Gatu. The Collegium employs around 40 researchers representing different fields in the humanities and the social sciences. And during their fellowship, they are given the freedom to focus on their own research um, relatively free from administrative duties. In addition to focusing on research, the Collegium Fellows also collaborate in interdisciplinary projects such as conferences and also on this Collegium Talks series, which aims to bring fresh perspectives um, on newest research to the public and shed light on what it means in practice to do research in the humanities and social sciences today. In this spring's discussion series, we decided to talk about research ethics from researchers' point of view. We'll discuss ethical issues faced by researchers when they collaborate with each other, design research projects involving live participants, or consider the impact of their work on society. Today's topic is the ethics of collaboration. So how do researchers choose who to collaborate with? How do we ensure fairness in collaboration? How do we negotiate authorship and acknowledgements? What ethical issues may arise in the relationship between PhD supervisors and supervisees, or between the principal investigator of a project and their project staff, for example? So these are the kind of questions that we'll be tackling today. So to start, could you all introduce yourselves briefly, starting with Anna? Thank you very much, Silva. So my name is Anna, and I'm a classical philologist from Moscow. Uh, but then, after I completed my PhD, I traveled a lot, first to Paris, then to Denmark, uh, then to Italy, and now I'm happily here in Helsinki. Uh, so my career started from studying ancient philosophy and uh, well, classical philology in general. But then I proceeded after Stoics and Socratics and Plato and Aristotle to towards the uh, obscure world of late antiquity and now I'm very happily uh, studying the uh, medical and philosophical and theological uh, aspects of the uh, physiology of human consciousness. So my project at the Collegium is focused on the study of a very obscure treatise written by a certain Nemesis of Emesa, and it beautifully encapsulates uh, different aspects of how human intelligence evolves and how physiology and our bodily aspects interact with each other um, to produce a human consciousness, this phenomenon of human consciousness. So that's my topic, and very multidisciplinary, as you can see, sphere of expertise. Yes, afternoon, everyone. My name is Andreas Bieler. I'm a professor of political economy from the University of Nottingham in the UK, and I'm fortunate to be here for one year as a co-fellow at the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies. My research mainly focuses on moments of resistance against neoliberal globalization and the particular role trade unions may play in these moments. So the project at the Collegium is on resistance against the privatization of water services. Okay, hi, uh, my name is Diana Simola. I'm a psychologist and a cognitive neuroscientist. I did both my master's and PhD here at the University of Helsinki, and I did my postdoc at the University of Paris 8. And my research topic is attention, broadly, like I'm interested in both. Um, what happens in our brain when we direct our attention to external stimuli, but also to more introspective um, thoughts. So my project at the Collegium is about mind-wandering. So more uh, the internal side of attention. 
Thank you, guys. Um, just a word about the structure of this panel as well. So we'll start a discussion among ourselves, but around the halfway point, um, I'll open the floor to you for questions, so you don't have to wait till the very end if you're like dying to ask a question. And then there's a longer question and answer period at the end as well. So if you have any questions, keep a good note of them. So guys, um, could you start by talking about how much you collaborate in your field or fields, since many of you are, you are interdisciplinary, and what form does collaboration take? And also, what are the benefits of collaboration in your view? Start with Jana, maybe? Yeah, um, so in my field, collaboration is really essential. We basically don't do any projects alone, because the projects tend to be very laborious, costly, and take a lot of time, so we need like a bigger group to be able to finish the work in a reasonable time. So collaboration usually starts um, by planning, designing the experiment together, and then de collecting the data. It's also good to have like many people doing that. Uh, then analysis uh, may also require like inter interdisciplinary teams, so like it's good to have someone who has more like technical background uh, involved. And then the process of writing is also done in collaboration. So yeah, collaboration in my field is really essential and also like uh, the interdisciplinary co collaboration. Andreas? Yes, yeah, very interesting to see the different traditions in different academic fields. So I'm a qualitative researcher within political economy. So by the very nature of the topic, we wouldn't be drawn to this kind of large collaborations. But that does not mean that collaboration doesn't take place. So I've been involved in co-authoring journal articles, uh, also co-authoring a book. And it can be very satisfying because if it goes well, then the outcome of this collaboration hopefully would be better than what each individual participant would have been able to produce her or himself. And so if it goes well, then, then that's extremely satisfying. And finally, I've also been involved in co-editing books, and that sometimes also involves practitioners as some of the co-editors or contributors. And that's also quite good, I felt, in the sense of we are more and more asked also to show the impact of our research and having some kind of practitioners already part of the kind of publication process can help to, to push that a bit further. Yes, well, um, in my field, since it can be broadly understood as the history of ideas, therefore it's all about collaboration, because ideas mean people, and people should collaborate and exchange, exchange these ideas with each other. So uh, in my field, it really, actually, the success of an individual, is very much as Andreas just said, depends on the success of this collaboration and discussion and bringing together various ideas and also uh, capacity and, and openness, you know, to, um, well, share your ideas and, and be collaborative and open towards some new challenges coming up from your colleagues. Because, for instance, uh, for my particular project, since it encapsulates uh, different expertise, so I have to collaborate with people from the history of medicine, history of philosophy, history of classical philology, I can't do without their expertise because I can't be, you know, that... Um, that a big expert myself. Therefore, I do depend on them and on their openness and on the collaborative, um, the development of the collaborative work that we have together. Great, so slightly different in different fields, but everyone needs to do collaboration, definitely. So could you talk about the issues that you've experienced collaborating and co-writing with colleagues? And also, how do you pick someone to, to co-write things with in the first place, and do you agree on the order of names in advance, and do you agree on the division of labor, and if you do, you know, how? Should we start with Andreas? Yeah, happy to, to go first on that. So, collaboration sometimes can emerge simply as a result of discussions at conferences with colleagues when you realize, actually, we have some joint ideas or what kind of project we may want to undertake in, in a particular area. Now, I think in any case, if it comes to that, it's important from the very beginning to discuss who does what, 
how the interaction takes place, what is the timetable, and perhaps also the, the order of names. My feeling is in social sciences, there's no clear kind of standard form of how to deal with the order of names. My personal preference is to do it alphabetically. When I said that to my daughter, she said, oh yeah, great for you. <laughs> you are called Beeler, so you're always coming, almost always coming first. Uh, but it's not because of that. Uh, it's because if you do it alphabetically, it's very clear to the outside that everybody's equally involved because the order of the names is not attached to any kind of value by outside the alphabet. Whereas if you start mixing names around, people start guessing, oh, okay, here mm -hmm. she's only number two. That means she has hardly contributed or less contributed. It's an open issue, but I don't think there's a clear standard form of that. Now, what are the problems? I think it can be very invigorating, very positive experience to co-write, but in my own experience, I've also mentioned, of course, there are clearly moments of frustration. So I would always be in a situation where I would intervene into the parts of what the colleague has written, but the colleague will also intervene in the parts which I first drafted. And then, of course, sometimes you open up the email, you look at the document and you see what's going on here. All my carefully crafted words are suddenly mixed up by that colleague. I'm not having that. Yeah? So there's a moment of irritation, and especially when it came to co-authoring the book, there were some tense Skype conversations with a colleague in Australia, always difficult with the time difference, about how to move forward when there are clear conceptual and empirical differences. And my, to be honest, on the basis of these experiences, I would say it's it's important to have a kind of a relationship of trust, and especially with the core also of the book, we've been close friends over several decades, and we are still friends after the co-authoring of the monograph, and the fact that we have been friends really helped us in overcoming these kind of difficult conceptual moments. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah um, where to start? Uh, Collaboration kind of starts naturally in my field because like you, if I want to work on a certain topic, I try to find people who have the same interest or know about the methods I would want to include in this study. Or perhaps I'm already part of a research group, uh, in which case we would like normally start working together on this topic. So. Yeah, only once I've like met people at the conference and we decided to like because we had same interest that we should work on this together. And um, the order of the names in articles and who should be included as an author is actually like uh, we have some guidelines that are kind of clear on like if a person has made a contribution, for example, in the design, in the planning, in the writing, in the analysis, in data collection, they should be included. And oftentimes journals also want to have this thing stated, like who contributed what, so, which kind of creates the transparency, so you know who has done what. And in our case, the first and the last authors has the sort of higher status, so, and they are also like the most responsible of the work, so, um, they would draft uh, the manuscript, which the others comment, but they are like, um, yeah, more responsible. But of course, everyone has to approve. And yeah, yeah, in the end, when the paper is sent to the journal, that they stand behind what has been written. And also, the, like, there might be issues like who should, who should be the first and what's the, yeah, the order because of this think that it's, it's not equal in that sense. So the, this should be discussed with the, with the group of authors beforehand, because the editors, they don't intervene, so they believe this is all agreed before submission. And in my case, I guess I've been lucky. I haven't really experienced any issues, but maybe because of these guidelines, which sort of help in negotiating the order. So you can say, like, oh, I did this part, so I should be here and here, and like, 
So that that helps. But of course, there have been cases when like not everyone has disagreed on some analysis or some things, which is then a matter of discussion and deciding together, like how should we do this? And one thing is that people are super busy these days, so there might be like delays because of people have just too many projects going on mm. at the same time. Mm. Yep. J just to follow up on that, I think that's actually quite important to, to have timelines clear with your cores, yeah? because mm. some, otherwise it gets frustrating. You think, okay, now it's over to you, and then nothing comes back for months. Yeah? And there might be different pressures on different people and also different requirements when they need yeah, to have exactly. new publications. And so the clearer one is in advance, I, I think the better. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, first, uh, I would like to comment upon the question and how, to, how you pick up your collaborators. And then, of course, everyone knows that very often it goes very naturally, I would say, just from the uh, sphere of your expertise and interests. So you just go for the best one, right? The best one who is the, the best expert in your field, and then you pick him up or her up uh, as your supervisor. And then also that's how you prefer or choose between uh, some potential collaborators. So therefore, it's quite difficult to uh, consider some ethical issues uh, from the academic perspective uh, when you want to reach some best um, decisions or best collaboration academically. But then where you can really make a choice, uh, it's where it comes to, for instance, considering your collaborators for, edi um, for an edited volume or a conference. And then here, I think I've been through all possible mistakes. Uh, I've just recently uh, finished editing, um, co-editing a volume. And then I think that the most important thing here is that you really need to agree upon certain procedure and very clear-cut deadlines and um, to distribute certain work between your uh, collaborators, because everything may happen. For instance, in my case, uh, the series collapsed, and most of uh, my friends who contributed, uh, who, who promised me that they would contribute, they uh, canceled their contribution after the one, one year of waiting and, you know, keeping, uh, feeding me with their promises that it is coming, it is coming. Uh, so, I mean, what is important is that unless you have a clear plan uh, right from the beginning and you are ready, to be honest, to make all the work just by yourself without relying on anyone, uh, well, unless you are ready to face with this, um, you might end up with having this situation, actually. It's not the best thing, but it may happen. And therefore, it's either you are really ready to all sorts of challenges that may happen, or you make a very good decision and arrive at a mutual understanding right from the beginning that you have a plan and that everyone actually, uh, everyone in the team is also very interested in receiving the result. Because very often, you know, as young scholars, we prefer to collaborate with some senior scholars who don't really need this sort of, uh, you know, co-edited volumes, one more co-edited volume. Uh, but, and therefore, well, they probably would not be so keen on keeping up with your uh, expectations. Therefore, well, that's important to kind of go through all these possible challenges right at the beginning and, uh, well, make sure that you are really responsible for the plan. Um, yes. <laughs> so can I pick up on that last point? So, yeah, we agreed that timelines are very important to agree on from the beginning, but in terms of the actual division of labor within a collaborative project, could you say a little bit more about, like, does this just emerge organically, or do you actually sit down and agree who's going to write what to ensure fairness? Oh, it just happens. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. I, th I think it's important to discuss that, and then sometimes it may be, oh, can you first draft that section, and I draft this section, or you need to decide who produces, who actually starts off with the paper, and then I think so some understanding, some discussion mm -hmm. of that is important right from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Also goes by expertise, like who's uh, the best one to do a certain analysis or to 
designed the task, so that kind of happens organically. Like, and and I think it's good also that like whoever has done whichever part for the for the article writes about like reports what he or she has done. And also in the case of collective volumes, because very often they come as a result of some um, conference or maybe uh, a long-term project. Uh, so there definitely should be some person who was responsible for planning the whole thing, you know, for uh, kind of creating the, the, the idea, the interdisciplinary idea behind the collaboration itself. Uh, so, therefore, definitely this person would be responsible for keeping uh, the core idea or the core problem of the whole collaboration obvious from the introduction, so clear from uh, the um, structure of the volume, etc. So, I think that the person who is responsible for this should be ready for uh, keeping this obligation through the whole volume, because your readers would not necessarily uh, be aware of what was the problematic setting of the collaboration work. And therefore, yeah, it's important that the whole thing should still hold together when the volume is out. Cool, thank you. So then, what about work that you're authoring alone, but that makes use of other people's unpublished data or ideas? So do you acknowledge people in the first footnote or in a separate acknowledgement section? And also, do you think that there are maybe ways of acknowledgement that are not strictly needed in order to be ethical or fair, but that are still considered good manners, and that would be good to, to consider, perhaps? Um, should we start with Anna? Um, well, I remember when I was still a PhD student, uh, it was very kind from a uh, very kind gesture from an older se senior and very famous professor after I asked him several questions at the conference and uh, s made several remarks. He emailed me and asked very kindly whether I would agree with uh, him mentioning my name in a footnote to the uh, in, in his article, and that, w that felt so nice. So I decided to always make uh, the same sort of gesture uh, whenever I would be in a similar situation, mm -hmm. and so I did. And also I think that also in my field, um, you know, it is very important to make, to be reader friendly. And when we are researching or studying some ancient texts, you know, the most important thing to discover is uh, the provenance of the ideas, how this author came up with this idea. So what authors, other authors influenced him and so on and so forth. And therefore just providing this provenance or some um, history of how you came up with your ideas would also be very reader friendly and we are all interested in having our readers interested in our um, in our topics in our ideas and keeping them you know kind of hooked to uh, to our logic to the reasoning that we provide therefore I think that giving this sort of personal uh, comments would also keep uh, them I interested and help their understanding of our ideas. So, yeah, I, I'm totally in favor of making this uh, footnotes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, first of all, we like the case of authoring something just by myself does not really happen. But acknowledging people's ideas, I've seen like, well, often the articles are a bit like technical and dry in that sense, but like I've seen if someone really had an idea for analyzing the data uh, in certain way that they said like, oh, we thank you for this idea. Um, yeah, so I've seen these acknowledgements and I think it's nice, nice to have them. And also like um, the guidelines say that you should tell the people who you are going to acknowledge in advance, so kind of ask for their approval, so yeah, it's good, it's good to also let them know in, in case acknowledging. Mm, that's a good point. Andreas? So in my field as uh, qualitative methods researchers, it's not really the case that we would assemble a kind of a database which could be just used by somebody else to do their own publication, so I think that kind of incident doesn't occur, but there have been perhaps similar to, to you, Anna, moments where in discussion somebody gave an 
additional idea, which I would then draw on, but I would also then mention in a footnote, mm -hmm. many thanks for to so-and-so for drawing my attention to that. Otherwise, I think there are always colleagues, thankfully, who comment on draft manuscripts, and then I think it's standard practice in a footnote mm -hmm. at the very beginning of an article or in the acknowledgements of a book, just to, to thank those colleagues for their effort. Yeah, yeah so gift economy, I think, is the <laughs> term that was mentioned yeah, in true. this yeah. context. Very yeah. good. So then the flip side of that, how do you make decisions about sharing your unpublished data, should you have it, with your colleagues? And what about requests to publish your work in, for example, an edited volume, possibly edited by a friend, when you would actually prefer to submit it um, to a peer-reviewed journal? Mm -hmm. Start with Andreas. Yeah, thanks. I, I think in, that's probably across a whole range of disciplines. Chapters in edited volumes don't count as much as, as would be a, a peer-reviewed uh, journal article. And so if somebody came to me, uh, oh, I, I would like to include your chapter in a volume, I probably would say I'm, I'm first going to, to publish it as an article. Not just because it counts more, but potentially an article in a journal is also more visible than just a chapter in, in a book. But I think once something has been published in, an edit, in, in a journal, you can then have a revised version, a shorter version, also appear as a book chapter. I think that's acceptable uh, mm. practice. One thing perhaps in, in addition to that, what I've sometimes noted at big conferences that senior colleagues approach PhD students and ask them to, to contribute their paper in reworked fashion to an edited volume. And of course, at first sight, I think from a PhD student point of view, that's very positive. Sometimes people feel flattered. They also don't feel that they are in a position to refuse that request. And I think it's actually the duty of the senior colleague not to do that, because the senior colleague does know that also for junior colleagues, it's important to get their work out in journal articles in order to become established academics, in order to have a chance uh, to get an academic position. And so I think that's a practice. Uh, uh, I would discourage senior colleagues from, from uh, engaging in. Thank you. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. So, so, <laughs> sorry, I was just um, that. That's true. But uh, to add to this, I would like to say that I think uh, in different disciplines, the the value of collected volumes might be mm. different. For instance, in my discipline, although yeah, definitely journals would count more, particularly for the universities and rankings and all those sort of things. But also at the same time, um, in in philosophy and in classical philology, uh, good collective volumes do count a lot for, for the researchers. For instance, I myself use them very much and, and um, because, you know, journals, they have a certain genre attached to them. So if you contribute to a journal, uh, you need to write in a certain genre and therefore, uh, if you want to rather go into some more interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary and more um, a different sort of uh, investigation of your topic. Therefore, it might not necessarily be so that uh, your article, the article that you come up with, will fit this journal genre. And also, um, well, in a collective volume, you can address certain issues that could only you know, shine when they're viewed from multiple perspectives, and therefore you just need this expertise of different volume to revise some history of anthropology, psychology, or consciousness, for instance, as in, in, in my case. Therefore, you just need this uh, different specialists in different fields, uh, and which, you know, in uh, journals, they would, be, they would contribute to di different journals, so you would never be able to arrive at this comprehensive view of certain issues. You. Uh, therefore, while well, they are quite valuable, uh, but also, of course, I completely agree that for young scholars or PhD students, it would be more um, uh, advisable to contribute to a journal for their career sake. So, yes, that's, that's the thing. Yeah, in terms of data, like if someone would analyze something on my unpublished data, I would like 
be happy to collaborate with them and work together on the topic. But in case if the, all the relevant research questions on that specific data have already been published, I see no reason why it could not be shared and maybe it should be published somewhere to mm -hmm. reuse of the data and open data practices. Mm -hmm. And um, what would you do? Would you get a situation where somebody would email you and want to access the unpublished data? Would that kind of a situation ever arise? Because I'm thinking in my field in linguistics, we gather databases and data sets, and people often know that you're doing it, but you haven't yet published your work because it's work in progress. So does that kind of a situation arise? Um, hasn't happened to me. So I guess maybe people are more or less collecting their own data and yeah, or using the open databases for, for further analysis. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, maybe that's a possible scenario as well. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, to add to this, I think in my field it would be rather, because we are not really producing, as classical phylogists do, don't normally produce a lot of data um, in a scientific, really scientific sense, but what we do is that very often you go to um, uh, some manuscript session in a library and make your own copy of some certain manuscript and then you can of course exchange this copy because there are a lot of digitalized manuscripts nowadays but sometimes some uh, unknown manuscripts you just have to copy them yourself. And, and then uh, yes, we do exchange this sort of manuscripts. Do you have a manuscript of this author, yeah, yeah, sure, I've been just to Bodleian recently, so here you go. And uh, yeah, I think that happens very often and does, well, probably need certain acknowledgement, but uh, well, it's different because uh, the scholar still has to do all the research by him or herself. Uh -huh. yeah, I would like to add to the sharing data that nowadays the EU regulations are quite strict also, like who you can give the data, so you have to state this in an advance in your data management plan. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. And it's also, some cases regulated to which countries you can give the data, or if, if you can give it outside the EU, for example. Okay, so that's something you need to check as a researcher. Yeah, it's good to, I mean, in my case, it's always like human data, which is sensitive, so, yeah, have to be careful. Definitely. Maybe should we pause at this point to check if there are any questions from the audience on the topics discussed so far. So if you have a question, there's going to be a mic coming over. Oh, is this working? Yes. Yeah. I have two questions, if I can ask two. Yeah. yeah. And they all come from personal experience, so asking for a friend. <laughs> uh, so first one, you were talking about this acknowledgement of ideas. What will you do? If you have been talking with one researcher and you mention one idea in passing, and you know the researcher say, oh, yeah, yeah, perfectly fine. Three months after, you've seen a paper published on that idea in academia. What do you do then? You threaten them with violence? You send a cynical email? <laughs> do you decide to shut up forever or, or, or what? Um. Well, I suppose that, because you mentioned that uh, this researcher published the article in academia. Yeah. So, well, so this is academia.edu, the website. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. I mean, this is going to be in an edited volume, but okay. basically the guy just uploaded, you know, the first page to academia. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, basically, um, I still can work on that, but I was really offended, in fact, to see sure. that no, there was not even a mention like, oh, this was an idea that came up in this meeting, talking with my colleague or something like that. So, I don't know, what will be your take on that? Like, like really, how to be ele elegantly tackle that? Mm. Well, you, you definitely have to make an, a very elegant comment, because <laughs> so that it would be obvious, you know, to some other colleagues, because uh, all the com comments on academia, they're open, right? So that they would get a hint that this colleague is not really trustworthy when it comes to exchange of ideas, because, yeah, it, it, it hurts a lot in this case. And I think that we also have to alarm our colleagues that, you know, well, this person is, has certain um, strange attitudes, mm -hmm. so it would be kind gesture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other thoughts? I mean, I think if, if somebody, if it's just an idea, Perhaps you, you're referring more also to a kind of a concept you're working on, or, or kind of a, 
And of course, if somebody used that, I, I would feel also of offended, and I would at least try and approach the person directly first and see what the response is to that. Yeah. Because no. if it's an Academia Edu, then it's not really fully published yet, and it could be still changed and amended. Yeah. yeah. No, no, it was basically, um, well, we could say work with archaeological material. It was an observation on some epigraphic, some inscriptions. That okay. In fact, ah, the okay. guy must be blind because he is more an epigraphist as I am, and he had not noticed that. Okay. So, yeah, that's probably so why that I, should I, should be be I would <laughs> seek the direct engagement with the person first. Yeah. And perhaps the uh, person will see reason then. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. And my second question is about one practice that is very common, but I don't know what to think about. It's like when you work in a research group and you publish a paper and you have different authors. And normally the, the, uh, the PI of this uh, research group needs to be quoted normally in the last, in the last, as the last name, even if this PI has not done anything at all. <laughs> so what do you think of this practice? Because sometimes, I mean, I kind of understand that, okay, as a PI needs to be quoted and perhaps putting them on the last like n a number of like authors is just and um, you know like a sign that this person is just the PI, but at the same time I think like come on you have not done anything here mm -hmm. you know why you should be quoted mm -hmm. you're already a big scholar you know so. I think it, it depends a bit on the fields and what convention is. I I think in in social sciences and arts and humanities. It's correct. Some people do that. They think because they are the PI of an ERC grant, for example, therefore they should be also on every publication coming out from that. But my, my position is there that, uh, of course, as the PI, you are on the one hand a researcher, and if you actively contribute to the writing of a particular publication, yes, then you should be on it. But on the other hand, you are also a mentor to the people you have employed for the project, and the mentor giving comments on a publication, in my view, doesn't justify that you become a co-author. Yeah, I mean, giving comments we do all the time, but that doesn't make us a co-author. And then the person also shouldn't be on it. Yeah, yeah I agree with Andreas that, like, I guess this is why the journals have started to request this, like, who did what to prevent the free, di free writers like that. And yeah, in case there is like a contribution, like the idea comes from that person or like they contributed to the writing, they gave comments. I think in that case, often, yeah, they are included in, in my field. Yeah, but it's problematic. Like I know cases where actually they didn't do anything and they got their names mm -hmm. on the papers. Thank you. And then we had a question over here. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I, will, um, I also have two questions, and the one is very much um, in line with the previous one. Um, thank you very much for sharing all the good practices, but I think the real world seems to be much more diverse. <laughs> I have been uh, teaching research ethics for 15 years, and my students have brought me cases that are almost unimaginable <laughs> what can happen. And about authorship, I was just thinking that, what do you think about this um, difference between different practices and disciplines, because on the one hand you say, okay, there may be different practices, but on the other hand, the researchers are competing with each other for grants, for awards, and if there are different practices between different fields, <laughs> you may be disadvantaged when in your practice, for example, it's not common that everybody in the group will be included as an, as an author. And I, I just give some, some, some examples. I mean, I had in my group one um, girl from Algeria who was saying in bio, biomedicine that she can't be an author before she has published or defended her PhD degree, because until that, the professor is the author of the article. So okay. this was the first practice. <laughs> and then um, there are people who are saying the gift authorship is something so common because, I mean, if you have a machine in physics, I mean, everybody wants to use this machine and, and this person gets 
200 articles per year because everybody needs this, mm -hmm. this machine. And then you have one humanity scholar who is very kind to the PhD students, is commenting, rewriting the drafts. And if it is very kind, I mean, the doctoral students will put an acknowledgement and say that, thank you very much, you really helped me, but no authorship. I mean, do you think this is unfair? And if it is, what would you recommend to do? Because we can't accept it like this. And I mean, there may be all kind of other cases, like in biomedicine, uh, people who uh, get their blood samples, they will become mm -hmm. authors. In sociology, those who just hand out the interview questions won't be authors and things like this. I mean, what to do about this in order to promote the good practices and get an agreement, not only in terms of Vancouver guidelines, but really in terms of absolutely um, mm -hmm. having the same practices and agreeing on the practices of mm -hmm. authorship in the whole world. Yeah, really yeah. important question. Do you want to um, start? Well, I think that the, f the first thing to be said here is that, uh, of course, we have different practices and different traditions bit, uh, among different disciplines, but also it's true that, you know, we are all making our career in one discipline, right? Therefore, uh, there are certain expectations and regulation in this discipline or within this discipline. Therefore, um, I mean, for instance, as a classical scholar, I know how many, uh, how much um, articles, uh, how many articles should be produced per year uh, by a well-to-do uh, classical scholar, um, and so on. There is so you you can kind of estimate or approximately estimate whether you are doing well on the regulation uh, according to the regulations of your own discipline. Therefore, uh, there are certain tracks and certain procedures uh, within every discipline which you could either um, fulfill or not. And then we all get acquainted with them as, as far as we are growing from PhD students to then following positions. But then it does come a very um, challenging uh, case when we are working within different disciplines in a multi multidisciplinary in environment, but then also as a PI, I think that uh, the most heavy responsibility, of course, is on the PI who should not only consider um, how academically his or her project should be arranged, but also uh, how beneficial should it be career-wise with regard to the career expectations of uh, his or her employees, etc. So, I mean, and everyone who has written um, ERC or some other applications applications, which are more or less all resemble ERC nowadays, uh, we know that these guidelines are most um, complicated. So how to apply all the different um, requirements for the multidisciplinary projects. So I mean, um, I just want to say that there should never be one coherent answer, of course, to this question, because there are just so many issues that should be involved, but uh, on every separate, every, each and every separate case should be considered, uh, yes, with, with some special regard. Yep. <laughs> we had an interesting situation at Nottingham University, where the university was giving out some scholarships, and so people from all kinds of different backgrounds applied, and people in the social sciences uh, lost out vis-a-vis -vis the natural scientists because they had fewer publications and they had lower research grants because if you apply in the natural sciences, you have this machinery and it's quickly in a million pound kind of dimension. And so it became apparent that there needs to be an understanding between the different disciplines about the different practices and that that needs to be taken into account in, in these kind of moments, yeah, and that's not always given, so we always need to work on that. And I think even in the other example you gave, it's not, we are not always self-reflective enough also about our own practices, yeah, and as senior colleagues, it was quite interesting just by discussing with my colleagues in the preparation of today, I suddenly thought, oh, actually, yes, in that recent instant, I also fell short, yeah, so I had been co-authoring an article with a PhD student and I just assumed my normal practice of 
alphabetical order, and I put myself first and him second, and alphabetically it was correct, and I think there are good reasons for doing so, although we are equally involved in the article, but I think I should have discussed with him first, as I did in the past, and said, look, this is how we're doing it for this and this reason, is that okay with you? And so I think also, even if one thinks, oh yes, my ethical practices are fine, I think it's good to remind ourselves about that and keep it as a kind of ongoing discussion. Yeah, I think that's a big, big question. Like, in my experience, like this has been like when psychology has, it's close to medical research, but it's not really so. And this now psychology is part of medical faculty in Helsinki, so suddenly like we are compared in equal terms, even though like our like um, publishing is very different. So, yeah, it's... Yeah, yeah, it's a big mm. problem when like comparing different fields to each other. Mm. So we need to be more aware of the practices in different fields. So, yeah, yeah, thank you for raising all these questions. Maybe we'll go back to a couple of more discussion points among ourselves. And if you have any more questions, do keep them in mind. So let's turn to our different academic roles. So PhD student and supervisee, the relationship that's already been mentioned. What ethical issues relate to the sharing of ideas and data between PhD students and their supervisors, in your opinion? And should such issues be regulated by, for example, some kind of a contract signed by both parties, as is done in some, dis some disciplines in some countries, but not everywhere? Should we start with Jana? Yeah. Um, I, I think the, um, there's a Finnish national board for research integrity that also gives guidelines for the both like the role of the supervisor and the PhD students, what are their rights, what are their obligations, what are their roles. So I think this is a very good way to approach uh, these things and also like to have an agreement in advance of what like both sides can expect and how fast the uh, work should proceed, etc. like how often they are supposed to meet. But, yeah, I mean, and I think it's also like something to decide between the both parties because like it might be that something works for another PhD student and doesn't for another, so it's good to have like the discussion also on the personal level, but of course, yeah, it's a like professional relationship and you should be like strict on like also deciding in advance, like the authorships, the orders uh, of the names, that, like, like things like that. So I think mm. they recommend that these issues should be discussed rather in, in advance than when like something unfortunate happens. Thank you. Um, Andreas? Yes, yeah, so in, in my field, it would not be automatic that the supervisor co-authors with the PhD students. So I think there are two different levels. The first level is just the provision of supervision, and I think some kind of contract can be useful in that respect. So at my university, uh, of, at the University of Nottingham in the UK, it's expected that we have 10 recorded supervision meetings with a PhD student per year. And so that ensures that there is supervision going on. 10, 15, perhaps 20 years ago, it was rather patchy. The PhD student depended on the goodwill of her or his uh, PhD supervisor. Some were very conscientious and others never commented beyond once a year. And so I think some kind of contractual establishment of expectation is important. And then when it comes to when it comes to, to co-authoring, I think uh, it's really a matter, in, in, in my case, if I'm actually co-authoring and be sharing the workload because the research projects and interests overlap so closely, then I also would be a co-author. And it's important, as I just mentioned, to discuss in advance order of names and why and, and who does what. But if I'm just giving comments on a draft manuscript of the PhD students, then it's not appropriate for me to be the cause. And mm. I would be just somebody next to others who, who gives comments. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, well, to add to this, I can uh, just refer to, to my rather painful experience. Well, I think that, of course, it's really, really good to have some certain discussion before you start uh, your PhD course or your collaboration, or maybe as a postdoc. Um, but then you, we, we all know that it's not always the case that it can really happen because there are certain, or in different countries, there are different academic traditions. For, for instance, coming from Russia, you know, a PhD supervisor would be considered some sort of a demigod when, while a PhD student will be a slave. And then, well, you're certainly just not in a position to raise any ethical issue about your relations. Uh, therefore, there is the, the only one advice that I might give in this situation, because sometimes we, we do find ourselves in this sort of situations, is that, uh, you know, it's very important to not arrive to um, uh, a set of a relationship when you are becoming, you know, more like a friends than a colleagues, because then it will, because very often PhD students really do this mistake, because they think that if they become uh, more or rather on the friend, friend basis uh, with, with uh, their supervisor, then it would help their relations, but uh, actually does not. Uh, therefore, well, that's just the only thing to keep in mind. But of course, in case if you are capable of arriving at a certain agreement beforehand, then that will smooth away all the possible difficulties. Thank you. So shall we move on to the next set of roles which already came up in this question? So the principal investigators of projects and the researchers on that project. So what ethical issues relate to the sharing of ideas and data within such a group where at least in theory there's it's a slightly more equal position between the different members? So how do you agree on authorship, which was the question raised earlier? Um, should the whole group be credited in the work of in the work that was mostly carried out by an individual from the group, and should the PI be credited any differently? That well, um, in, in my field where everything really depends very much on the initial setting of the project, uh, because, well, I mean, unless a supervisor or a PI of the project really pose certain questions, certain research problems, uh, the research would simply not go into this way. Therefore, uh, it's really important to actually credit a PI uh, because he or she provided the set of the problems, the structure, everything for, for the research project. Therefore, I mean, uh, you can always um, mm, vary the way you credit a PI. It, it, can, it cannot necessarily be uh, a co-authorship, but rather maybe an acknowledgement or some sort of a footnote or just mentioning uh, his or her name uh, in a certain way. But I do believe that depending on the initial structure of the project, uh, all the roles should be mentioned and all the names should be mentioned, all the names of the um, participants of the team who really contributed in different ways. And then in the article it's really easy to make it because you can just, uh, well, precise what was the contribution uh, in, in this case. Um, but so, yeah, that just be open and, and clear about uh, tracking your ideas? Yana? Yeah, I would say it all depends on contribution, like the being a member of the same research group or the PI like doesn't necessarily or shouldn't entitle you to the authorship, so mm -hmm. yeah, unless there's like some clear contribution to the work. And is this something you would agree on at the beginning of the, of starting the research group? Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, it's it's agreed. Like, the, mm -hmm. like in practice, like some people start working on something together, so they are like automatically already contributing, and then maybe later on, we might discover that oh, we need some help from from some other people. So then, depending on how much they did for that work, they would either be like mentioned in the acknowledgements or, or included as authors. I think very often the, the PI is probably the more senior person in this kind of research group setup. And so 
I think that, that, that's why I would also challenge more senior colleagues to constantly stay engaged with ethical questions because it really is then up to you to acknowledge that you've got a dual function. On the one hand, of course, you are also a researcher in the project, but on the other hand, you're also a mentor. And so acknowledging all this, I think, is important, but that can be done in different ways. But when it comes to co-authorship, I think that distinction is crucial. Yeah. And when the PI has been involved in co-authoring, then she or he should be a co-author. But again, if it's mm -hmm. just kind of providing feedback on drafts by members of the research group, at least within my field of the social sciences, then I think a co-authorship is uh, not justified. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So we're drawing to a close. So before we open the floor to more questions, so we've had some examples of good practice in research ethics and importantly, some examples of bad practice. So to close up, what advice would you all give as regards research ethics in collaboration? Uh, first of all, to researchers at the beginning of their careers, so PhD students, postdocs, and secondly, to more senior academics, people in PI roles, supervisor roles, and such. Should we start with Andreas? Yeah, so I think from a, if you are at the beginning of your career, I think it's important nonetheless, even though there's a power imbalance vis-a-vis -vis the PI, still to be confident enough and at best right at the beginning to raise those issues. The longer you wait, I would imagine the more difficult it becomes once certain patterns of behavior have been established. But again, as I just mentioned, from the point of the senior research, I just would say that's also, of course, valid for myself, also due to recent experience. Uh, I think from a senior researcher, it's important to stay engaged with these ethical questions and to keep on reflecting on one's own practices in a critical way, because it's too easy to fall into a position of thinking, oh yeah, I'm doing it all fine and then suddenly no longer being sensitive to the kind of uh, power imbalances which may be in play there. Yeah, yeah to junior uh, researchers, I would advise to, well, first of all, like, know your rights, and to, like, when considering joining a research group, I would advise to interview the people who already work in that group, so to know, like, what are the practices and, like, how the supervision works. Like, I think that's very valuable information when you consider spending like some, yeah, years of your life in, in a certain environment. And yeah, I agree with what Andrea said about the, like the more senior uh, researchers, they should be, and actually, that's their role also to let the junior people know about the research ethics and the ethics of collaboration. So, and also reflect on their own practices. Um, I think I would like to focus on the difference between the terms ethics and collaboration because uh, when we think ethics, we think about certain ethical norms and then very often we assume that they're more or less similar, you know, cross country and uh, so ev every country is in different academic traditions should have more or less similar research norms and that's not really the case because there are so many cultural differences, etc. So both to a uh, PhD or postdocs and to the PIs, I would advise to uh, not really rely on certain uh, unspoken and undiscussed ethical norms that, that we assume, that we always tend to assume, but rather to focus on collaboration, right, and under, on arriving at a mutual understanding and uh, keeping an ongoing discussion about all sorts of uh, potential issues. Uh, and then also for the PhD students or for junior uh, scholars to not, you know, keep uh, your, to, to, to be shy and uh, to, to be uncertain whether rise or not rise certain issues, they should be discussed and gone through because thus you can also contribute to the um, you know, very smooth and nice work and nice um, um, atmosphere of your research group. Therefore, just keep going a discussion and then I think it will help uh, a good collaboration practice. 
Thank you very much, guys. So before we go to questions and answers again, let me advertise the upcoming talks in this series. So next week on 12th of March, we have a session on the ethics of research design, and then, then there's a, a week's gap. And then on the 26th of March, we have a session on the ethics of impact. So stay tuned if you're interested in hearing more about these topics. There will be more information on the websites and the social media accounts of the Collegium and of Think Corner. So now um, the mic is going to come around again for more questions from the audience, if there are any. Well, we've possibly exhausted them all earlier. <laughs> is there anything on the earlier questions that you feel like you'd like to add something more about, maybe? So we had the question about PI authorship, and then, yeah. Um, Uh, no. Perhaps it's finished. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I had a second question also uh, when Andreas was speaking. I think it was a very um, interesting question actually, what to do when you should actually have an option between uh, publishing in a volume or, or go for a, for a journal. And I think very often it is so that you are invited to a conference, the outcome of which will mm. be a volume, which gives an additional touch to it, that yeah. you actually, um, I don't know, betray your, the organizers or your colleagues who have invited you, and you say that, no, no, I actually want, uh, want rather to go to, to the journal article. So this is an additional aspect, I think, and I, I, I just um, wanted to have your comment on that, whether um, sometimes it is so that it is said afterwards that we are going to do a volume. Then perhaps it's easier, but if it is already with the invitation, this may be mm. a possibility to address this issue. But um, about a misconduct issue, I was just thinking, um, you were saying that the solution could be that you just publish in both journal and uh, volume. I mean, of course, there is a copyright issue and the journal, if it allows to do it again and so on, but. There is a big issue that is now discussed in research ethics is self-plagiarism. And I just wanted mm -hmm. to raise this issue because there mm -hmm. seems to be a totally countries are very different about their approaches. Some say this, for example, Netherlands says it is as severe as plagiarism. Mm -hmm. uh, the others are saying, oh, we never have thought about it and um, nobody reads the articles anyway. I should publish it in multiple places mm -hmm. because <laughs> then there is a possibility that people will read my work. Um, what do you think Good. about this issue? Is this a gray area, or is it an unacceptable practice, as the new LA code is also saying? So. I, I, I think, to, if, if I can go, go first, I think it, it is a gray area. I think the term self-plagiarism, I mean, that I'm already skeptical about that. I mean, what, what is that supposed to mean? Yeah, in, in a way, how can you plagiarize yourself? But I think one should still nonetheless also oneself pay attention to that. And when I said then to republish a journal article in a book, I didn't mean exactly the same. Sometimes that happens. Colleagues bring different articles together in one place, and there can be a good reason for that but then it's normally mentioned at the beginning that chapter was already published in that journal and so on. But when I would republish, I would uh, normally, I mean, would be a revised version, perhaps a 9,000 word article cut back to a 6,000 word book chapter or so. There would be still some overlap, safe plagiarism, perhaps some people would then refer to, but I, I think I would see that as an acceptable, uh, as an acceptable practice. Uh, but it's important to discuss that, yeah, because I think it is a gray area. Yeah, good point. And then how do you yeah. measure it? And of course, we have now technology that one could perhaps, yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, I, I think that it is really problematic. For instance, recently I got a rejection from one journal because uh, the reviewer, he noticed that my dissertation was written on the similar topic, but of course he did not see my dissertation mm -hmm. and my uh, thesis was not published as a book. I mean, it is available online because in Russia there is a law that once you defend your thesis, it should be available online, and mm -hmm. it is, but it is of course available in Russian. And then uh, I published so the topic is similar, but the reviewer, obviously, he does not read uh, in, uh, in Russian. Therefore, he just, you know, compared the titles, but then, well, the, the topic itself, the, the material itself is really different. And uh, then, so I've got this pretext that, oh, it might be the same, it, it's not. So I think that it is uh, kind of really problematic, and uh, on the one hand, um, we could also ourselves measure the amount of repeated um, repeated information, and uh, as far as um, the editors of the volume, for instance, could allow us to self-plagiate ourselves, for instance, to the amount of 30% or something, maybe it might be uh, doable or allowable, but of course, you know, it depends on uh, your own kind of um, attitude towards this. And then also to add uh, to your question about um, uh, publishing collective volumes, that's really a very important thing that everyone should remember is that very often when the invitation comes, and of course there is the expectation of an up upcoming collective volume, I think that it is important to make, uh, to agree to participate in the conference with this remark that, but I'm not sure whether I'm going to really mm -hmm. contribute to the volume because it really happens very often. For instance, it sadly happened with me recently that, uh, you know, all the authors uh, decided to contribute, and we've been waiting for this for three years, and after three years, the project was cancelled. So you kind of, you write the paper, and then, of course, you're waiting. So it can happen, therefore, uh, I didn't know about this before, but now I do, and therefore, you know, to keep this op option open is really um, good, I think, and considerate. Yeah, maybe I would also try to if possible, make my uh, the organizers and my colleagues happy, and try to like find an other angle maybe on the conference proceedings and on the article. And if there is enough data, maybe like publish part mm -hmm. in the like s somehow divide between them. But not, of course, it's not possible to have the exact same paper in mm -hmm. in both of. I think it's also important for the person who organizes a workshop or a conference to appreciate in advance yeah. that there is this different value attached to book chapters and articles, at least in some disciplines. So what we've tried to do in relation to a workshop last June at Nottingham is to try to get a special journal issue out. And if you do that then, of course there's no guarantee you may succeed with that, but if, if you do that, that's then also more attractive for the various participants mm -hmm. at yeah. the, the, the workshop. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and also like I would rely on the organizers that they know this situation yeah. and like yeah, they are aware of why why people have to do this. Great. Do we have other questions from the audience? Nope. Then, um, big thanks to all of you who came to this session and listened attentively to the end. And thank you very much to our three speakers. I think we had an excellent Collegium Talk session, and I hope to see many of you at the following ones. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.